Hello and welcome to what is part number four of the 100 Years War, the history of England and France. If you haven't watched one, two or three yet, please stop what you're doing. Go watch those first. The link is in the description down below. And while you're there, please consider liking, commenting and if you haven't yet, subscribe as well. You can also hit that notifications bell so you know when my next videos are. Now let's get into it. <laughs> Left off in 1373, the elder widow Edward III of England had lost nearly everything that he had gained over the years and his life was practically in ruins. His once prestigious court was now ruled by his rich and powerful mistress, Alice Perez. And the French had their tails up with their king Charles V of France and his general Bernard de Gousselon had been going around France gathering up towns, liberating them, fortifying them against the English. All England held now was Gascony and Calais, but only just. In 1375, Edward III felt like he needed to bring prestige back to his court and arranged a glorious tournament that would bring his prestige and glory back to his court. And he gave the seat of honor to his mistress, Alice, who was now sitting in the place of a public favorite, the now dead Queen Philippa. And this did not go down well with the public. The tournament was made a mockery by the public. To make things even worse, Alice went and married Sir William, the Baron of Windsor, who was 25 years her senior. She continued on with her life of extortion and bribery, using her influence over the king, and she sold access to the king, and she amazed a fortune of around eight million pounds in today's money. The House of Commons in the Parliament had to step in and remove Alice in 1376 away from the king. The Parliament had actually been getting stronger and stronger and gaining more power. It even started to refuse to bend to the will of the king and Edward's second son, John of Gaunt, was actually angry at this because the House of Commons had the right to overrule royalty. Previously, any member of the royal family could impose a tax at will whenever they liked it. But now the parliament said that the sovereign had a sign off on the tax, had to agree to it. And this still happens in England today. In May 1376, a weak, sick and old King Edward sat watching his son and heir, the once mighty slayer of the French, the Black Prince, slowly die and pass into legend. A year later in 1377, Edward III's household deserted him, his powers were taken away and he started to knock on heaven's door. Alone with his mistress Alice, he lay in his bed. She stole the rings off his fingers and he died in his palace all by himself. Edward III's reign would be remembered for centuries as the closest thing we will ever get to the mythical court of King Arthur and the Round Table. His grandson, the Black Prince's son, Richard II, became king in 1377 at the age of 11. This boy king had some big shoes to fill and the nobles expected a return to the glory days. Will he be able to pull England up by their bootstraps? Well, in 1381, there was a peasant rebellion that tore through London. They destroyed palaces, ransacked the city, and beheaded the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was the highest ranked bishop in England. Things clearly did not start well for the young king. He was somewhat of an oddball, intelligent, artistic, and liked by his friends. But ultimately, he was a terrible leader of people. To be successful back then as a ruler, you needed to lead the most important men in your country and you had to be utterly ruthless when time asked for it. Richard had neither of these traits. In fact, he intervened in matters of state when he shouldn't have and he demanded things that he shouldn't have. He hated war, which was a big no-no as a medieval king because all the king's duty was to make his country glorious through conquest. As for France in the 1370s, their king Charles V had been trying to get a peace treaty with England, but he had no success in this. So he decided to make his army stronger and he put pressure on the papacy, giving him money. The papacy was then influenced by the French. The French held influence over the popes. By 1378, the French and the papacy's relationship hit a snare and this led to a papal schism, which led to a divide in Europe for the next 40 years. By 1380, Charles V 
had breathed his last breath, and his 11-year-old son, Charles VI, became king. Now, we fast forward 17 years to 1397 to England, where two men were accused of treason and were ordered to have a trial by combat to prove who was guilty and who was innocent. The idea was that God would give the innocent party strength to overcome the guilty party. One of the men was the grandson of Edward III of England, and his name was Henry Bolingbroke. So he was King Richard II's cousin, and the other was the Duke of Norfolk. The two men mounted their horses and leveled their lances, and they were preparing to charge when the king stuck out his white scepter. Richard II ordered them both to be banished from the country. This was a bad move, because Richard's cousin, Henry, decided he didn't like to be banished, and he returned to England two years after at the head of an army, and he sought revenge and murdered his cousin, Richard II. He then took the crown of England and placed it on his head as the usurper king, Henry IV. Remember way back when I started this series, all the English kings spoke French? Well, Henry IV spoke English as his first language, so he was the first English-speaking English king, and his actions as the usurper king would eventually lead to the War of the Roses, as two descendants from Edward III fought over the English crown in a civil war, but that wouldn't happen for the next 56 years, so don't worry. Now, why am I telling you all of this and not talking about the war with France? Well, these are the years of relative peace between the two countries, who have been fighting for decades at this point. Even with all the mess happening in England, the French didn't seize the opportunity to come over to England and put one on them. Because they had in-house fighting of their own. The wealthy royal dukes squabbled over their lands, but the King Charles VI calmed everyone down, and then he started to suffer from a mental illness which would affect him for the rest of his life. This incapacitated his forces. He even thought he was made of glass and feared that he would shatter if anyone touched him. He had reinforced clothing made to protect him in case of accidental shattering. If you remember back to the Battle of Patoué, we have King John II who was captured by the English, and you will recall that he was caught along with his teenage son, Philip. And Philip had grown up to become the Duke of Burgundy at this point. And he held so much power and so much wealth and so much influence, he was almost a king in his own right. And he didn't have to bow or yield to his younger nephew, the actual king. It goes to show you how much trouble both sides were in at this point. Back in England, Henry IV literally grasped hold of the throne, clinging to it, and tried to legitimise his rule as the House of Lancaster being the rightful heirs and the rightful kings of England. He didn't do anything, really, except for instate a law which stated that all heretics should be burnt at the stake. He also fathered one of England's most heroic kings, who would see the divisions in France and kickstart the bloody final chapters of the 100 Years' War, Henry V. By the time Henry V became King of England after his father's death in 1413, the French and the English had been fighting for 76 years, and this war spanned generations. The French fighting the English and the English fighting the French had become a tradition. Finally, Henry V was on the throne of England. Now, if you don't know who he is, he is the serious contender to be potentially England's greatest monarch of all time. In the words of one historian, by the end of his reign, he had transformed the spirit of his people to become the arbitrator of Christendom, dwarfing the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope himself. Henry V's contemporaries, his peers, agreed with this idea that he was a great king. He was smart. He was focused, and he was an extremely talented military leader and commander who was full of vigour and energy. This, of course, is the English view of him. On the other side, the French called him cold, ruthless, and the embodiment of a monster. Henry V was determined to unify church and crown, so he went on a heresy murdering spree because it was his duty. And it was good politics to be seen as a religious extremist because the medieval church was the best propaganda tool a medieval king had in their arsenal. For the first two years of his reign, he ensured that there was a real meeting of minds and a collaboration between leading nobles. And he was exceptionally ruthless to anyone that stepped out of line. 
he would send them to the gallows. He even executed his own uncle after treasonous acts. This was a power play to show everyone, and even the French, who the real boss was, and it unified his court. With a unified country and a unified court, Henry V set his eyes on the country's old enemy, France. After years of a semi-medieval Cold War, things were about to get hot. Really hot. You see, Henry V felt that he had been cheated out of his birthright due to the Treaty of Brittany in 1360. And if he couldn't inherit the French throne, he'd have to take it for himself. The French too started to get their act together, even with their mentally ill King Charles VI. And when they caught wind of Henry V's plan, they sent a medieval equivalent of bring it on. And in 1415, Henry appealed to that old English patriotism by repeating his grandfather's claim that the French were trying to eradicate the English and the English language. And from here on out, England had their language. English was made the first language of England. He went on to gather an army around the country, consisting of 320 captains, archers, knights, and anyone else who would come along. And they all set out to Southampton in August 1415. Henry wrote a final warning to the French Dauphin, the heir to the French throne. And he was the real power of France at this point because his father was mentally disturbed and mentally ill and his uncles were squabbling between themselves. And this letter read, friend, give us what we are owed. Avoid this deluge of human blood. But there was no response. In total, an army of 12,000 left England and the war was back on. Henry and his army landed at the walls of Harfleur in a united France, and they were in a dangerous position. The French army was just 50 miles away at Rouen, and Henry needed to quickly capture this castle of Harfleur so he could set up a base, but it took a laborious six weeks to capture it, and it meant it was almost October when they had it, and this was not campaigning season. Normally, medieval armies went home for the winter because fighting in winter was tough, and supplying an army in the winter was nearly impossible. But to go home after capturing one measly castle, Henry would see himself as a failure, and he had no choice but to stay in France with a French army hot on his heels. Find out what happens in part number five, where we see the blood-soaked fields of Agincourt. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you want to see next after the series. Like, comment, subscribe, the more you know.